Good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I'm Flori Lazier, President and CEO of the Corporate Council on Africa, the leading US business association focused solely on Africa and connecting business interests on the continent. I wanna thank each of you for joining us for day three of our leaders forum on resilient US-Africa business engagement to drive post-COVID-19 recovery. Yesterday, we had a very dynamic conversation on our session on the economic and health innovations in response to COVID-19. The session featured remarks from His Excellency Felipe Niusi, President of Mozambique, and a high-level panel of private sector leaders and government officials who explored the innovative steps taken by African governments and the US and African private sector to fight the pandemic and mitigate the effects of the economic downturn that's been caused by this pandemic. I'm grateful to all the African US government and private sector leaders who shared their insights during yesterday's session and to the public and private sector leaders who speak during today's session and the one to follow. Tomorrow is uh, the last of our four days of the Leaders Forum. I'm also deeply thankful to our sponsors and media partners, AcroBridge, AfroTourism, Caterpillar, City, Covington and Burling, Creative Associates, Development Finance International, Flutterwave, General Electric, Lockheed Martin, Procter and Gamble, Raven Martin and Visa, and to our media partners, All Africa, APO Group and Jeune Afrique. Your support of this forum during these unprecedented times shows how committed you are to CCA and to strengthening and advancing US Africa trade and investment. Now our session today, Resiliency in Action, Drivers of Growth in Post-COVID Africa will highlight key sectors beyond health that are critical to post COVID-19 economic recovery. We are definitely looking forward to a rich and insightful conversation among our high level panelists who are playing each of them a critical role in addressing these issues. Now I am delighted that Ms. Bonnie Glick, the Deputy Administrator of the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, has agreed to offer opening remarks for this session of the Leaders Forum. Ms. Glick, we are honored to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us today. And let me thank you again for joining us uh, during the event we had in New York uh, this past fall during UNGA uh, on linking health and economic growth in Africa. That was a great session and we thank you for being there with us and again for coming today. Ms. Glick was most recently the Deputy Secretary of the Maryland State Department of Aging where she was appointed by Governor Larry Hogan. Before that, she was in the nonprofit world at Meridian International Center and also worked in the private sector at IBM. Ms. Glick began her career as a foreign service officer in the Department of State, where she served tours of duty at the US mission to the United Nations during Operation Desert Shield, at the US embassies in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and Managua, Nicaragua, she served on the staff of the Secretary of State's Operations Center, and then as a senior officer in the White House Situation Room, and then in the State Department's Bureau of Western Hemispheres. Ms. Glick holds a bachelor's in government and international relations from Cornell University, a master's degree in international affairs from Columbia University, and an MBA from the Robert H. Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland. Thank you so much again, Ms. Glick, for joining us and over to you. What is that? Hey, can you go to the thing? Flori, thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you for having me here with all of you today. 
It was great to be with you in New York, and I look forward to being able to see you and the rest of the Corporate Council on Africa in person soon. As we all know, recovery from COVID-19 depends on the creativity, efficiency, and ambition of our private sector. So it's so important that these conversations are taking place. From the perspective of USAID, USAID, we know that America has always been and will always be a country of bold action. We know that a threat to health security anywhere is a threat to health security everywhere. And that's why we are the world's largest provider of health and humanitarian assistance. In the 21st century alone, the US has contributed over $140 billion to maintain global health security around the world. In response to COVID-19, we've engaged in what we're calling our All of America effort. It includes all parts of American society, from government to NGOs, charities, and the private sector. To me, among the most extraordinary things to see is how corporations and companies and small manufacturers have all rallied to retool their standard operations to provide resources to combat the novel coronavirus. The liquor companies that are now making hand sanitizer, the electronics and motor companies that now make ventilators, the clothing manufacturers who now make masks and gowns. We're seeing this all across the world and we're seeing it particularly in Africa. It's a remarkable sight to behold indeed. The US government has contributed more than $12.4 billion to combat COVID-19, which includes more than $1.3 billion in assistance from USAID and the State Department. That assistance is specifically aimed at fighting the pandemic in over 120 different countries. And that number does not reflect the generosity of private businesses, nonprofit groups, charities, faith-based organizations, and individuals, as well as the ingenuity of our scientists, researchers, and innovators. Together, these businesses and organizations have provided $4 billion in donations and assistance to combat COVID-19 accounting for nearly 80% of global philanthropic efforts. In Sub-Saharan Africa, our US government contribution of assistance includes more than $361 million to meet the critical needs of communities, governments, and of course, the health workers on the front lines of the pandemic. In Nigeria, to name one example, USAID is providing more than $37 million of additional funding to help Nigeria respond to the pandemic. And we recently delivered 50 state-of-the-art US-made ventilators to South Africa, the initial delivery of our pledge of up to 1,000 ventilators in order to assist in the South African national response to COVID-19. Those are just two examples of our response to the immediate needs of COVID-19 in Africa. We're working to scale up assistance and to prioritize the pandemic response in all of our programming across the continent. We're also looking at ways to use our assistance to catalyze private sector investment, because we know that private enterprise is the most powerful engine for lifting people out of poverty. It exemplifies what we mean when we say that the purpose of foreign aid should be to end the need for its existence. 
countries are best able to provide for their needs of their citizens when there's a vibrant private sector in place locally. The private sector creates jobs and by definition, revenues to the governments in the form of taxes. This cycle is one of sustainability, what we refer to as self-reliance. Our goal ultimately is to end the need for foreign assistance in a way that allows countries to be able to provide for their own citizens, to provide an environment in which private enterprise thrives and flourishes and provides the conditions for communities that are peaceful and stable. In the wake of COVID-19, USAID is building on existing partnerships to align with the new market realities. We're adapting our programs to identify new market-based solutions. For example, in Ghana, we're partnering with local enterprises and factories that normally produce clothing and apparel, and we're taking the time to pivot to producing masks, medical gowns, and other personal protective equipment. Through Power Africa, we redirected more than three and a half million dollars to support healthcare facilities and utility companies to cope with the impact of the pandemic on access to electricity. And through the Prosper Africa initiative, we're substantially increasing trade and investment between the US and Africa, harnessing the power of the private sector to drive shared economic growth and prosperity. Prosper Africa, as everyone knows, will play an important role in blunting the economic impact of COVID-19 by ensuring that American businesses in Africa can continue to support local workers, keep exports flowing, and stabilize investment. So let me make a point that too often is overlooked. Foreign assistance is not just a numbers game. It's not just who has written checks, how much they're for, and who they're written to. Foreign assistance is a reflection of a nation's core principles and values. America's foreign assistance has always been designed to promote national sovereignty, prosperity, democratic governance, and individual rights. In contrast, the Chinese Communist Party's foreign assistance is reflective of their values, and it has very little to do with development and a whole lot to do with intimidation, influence, resources, and the projection of power. USAID offers a journey to self-reliance, while Beijing promotes a journey to dependence on China. And we're seeing this most clearly on the African continent. As we look beyond the short term, we know that COVID-19 will continue to have an extraordinary impact around the world for years to come, long after the pandemic phase subsides. In light of this, USAID is looking at the next order impacts of COVID-19. This over the horizon review will ensure that our investments around the world are well positioned to be effective in a post-outbreak world. While we continue to lead the global response to the immediate impacts of COVID-19, we're also preparing for the lasting changes to the economic, development, and humanitarian landscape that we will all see. And with sustained engagement with the private sector, we will lay the necessary groundwork for longer-term economic growth, prosperity, and self-reliance. So with that, Flory, thank you so much for the opportunity to join you all here today. It's always an honor to be with the Corporate Council on Africa. Thank you so much and best wishes for the rest of this conference. Thank you so much, Ms. Glick, for your generous time that you gave to us today, for the insightful remarks that you made on the role of AID and the US government more broadly. Uh, in supporting Africa 
during the pandemic and in ways that relate to both health and beyond health, uh, the economic recovery. So thanks again uh, for being with us. Uh, we appreciated having you here. Now we're going to transition to our high level panel discussion, which I'm sure will be really interesting as the ones of the previous days of the Leaders Forum have been. It's my pleasure to introduce the moderator of this session, Dr. Ache Leke, senior partner, Johannesburg chairman of McKinsey Africa. Before I turn it over to Acha, I just want to provide some information and housekeeping rules uh, for the question and answer period. Please use the Zoom chat function to send us your questions. We look forward to asking them should time permits. We've got a great panel and so I'm sure uh, uh, they will take up a lot of time sharing information with us, but we'd like to take some of your questions as well. So please submit them through the Zoom chat function and we will only take questions from those who have provided their names, first and last name and your affiliation. So please remember when you're entering your questions in the chat to say who you are and who you're with. So Acha, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Flori, um, for that introduction. Thanks for the invitation to um, to moderate the, the, this panel the, uh, today, uh, this afternoon, Joburg time, morning, U.S. time. And just uh, some context. So we, you know, we're doing this in a time where Africa is about to hit 350,000 COVID cases. Right, we woke up to about 330,000 cases this morning, um, and we're starting to see an exponential uptake in quite a few of our countries. Right, they, at some point there were big debates as to whether we would see it or not. Um, but having said that, you know, in an, in, uh, we had to balance, you know, saving lives and safeguarding livelihoods. And so we've had to start to reopen our economies. So many of our, our economies are starting to reopen, you know, some slower than others, but starting to reopen uh, in a context before we hit the peak, right? So on, unlike other countries where we were open after they hit the peak, here we're reopening before we hit the peak. And so it's very important we're seeing many of our public sector and private sector leaders needing to grapple with this whole idea about how do I focus on resolve and resilience, resolving the crisis, but also how do I think about return to work and how do I reimagine what Africa could look like uh, going forward. And so this session today is really focused more on the whole return and reimagining, right? You know, thinking through how can some key sectors, and we'll talk about our panelists today, they represent many of these sectors, how could they contribute to driving growth in the post-COVID world, growth and recovery across the continent? And as McKinsey, we had actually done some research on this to look about, you know, to think about how do you reimagine Africa? We had interviewed about 20 or so uh, um, uh, leaders across the continent to really understand how they think about reimagining Africa. I just wanted to share, you know, a few of the lessons learned, we learned from them. So we came up, you know, we identified about nine bold ideas to reimagine Africa. And some of these ideas is what we're gonna unpack uh, in the session today. One is about how do you reimagine society? And within that, we think, you know, digital, and we're going to talk a lot about that today, I'm sure, how digital is really going to transform Africa and how the crisis is really an impetus to accelerate Africa's digital transformation. The second thing the crisis has also uh, uh, made us aware of is the plight of the urban vulnerable populations. A lot of focus in the past had gone into really helping the rural vulnerable, sort of the smallholder agricultures, farmers, and now we're starting to see more and more focus and figure out how do we support urban vulnerable because we've seen how they struggled uh, through the crisis. The third on society is the healthcare sector, right? You know, a huge call for action to transform Africa's healthcare sector to make sure it's more resilient and more equitable going forward. So that's on society. On business, and we're starting to see it already, you know, sector competitiveness, strengthening consolidation in different sectors. You know, the market structure of these sectors will look very, very different again, and huge opportunities for, 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 for huge, huge risk but also big opportunities for, for companies that we call resilience who win coming out of this. Fifth is manufacturing, right? We think there's a huge, huge opportunity through the crisis to reshape Africa's manufacturing and focus on, on self-reliance, uh, to focus, to reshape it, to focus really on, on self-reliance and make sure that we, you know, we, we, we manufacture more products locally as we've seen what has happened with some of the, the imports that have been banned. And then the sixth on the business side is really formalization of our economies. A lot of uh, SMEs are really struggling. The 90 million SMEs in Africa, only 15% or so are registered and, and they're struggling and they're, they're the most vulnerable. 
right? And so, and a lot of the stimulus packages that have gone in have gone to help the, 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 those that are registered. So how do you use this opportunity to really encourage SMEs to formalize uh, over time? And we think, you know, the winners, uh, countries that are, that are within that space could actually do a good job there. And then finally, there's an opportunity to reimagine government, right? So one is we believe there'll be a much more active involvement in government in the economy going forward. It's, it's very clear that's going to happen, but also a better partnership between government and the private sector. The private sector has played a key role in supporting government uh, across Africa in addressing uh, the crisis. And so we see there's a lot more trust now. And so there's a much better partnership we think can emerge out of this between government and the private sector. There's a contract between citizens and government, right? We think citizens have really come to realize that the importance of governments, they decide if your kids can go to school, they decide if you can leave your house. And so we think there'll be a stronger contract. Citizens will think uh, think think more now about you know, who they actually elect into, into office. But also as governments have put out packages to really support vulnerable, and many of these packages didn't exist because we didn't have social safety nets in many of our countries, we think there could be some expectations coming out of this from our citizens. So how are we gonna to continue to support the most vulnerable? And the last one is you know, Pan-African cooperation. We've seen the, the continent really step up and unite uh, to address this crisis. And we think there's, you know, be a lot, there's a lot of momentum here to strengthen regional Pan-African cooperation. Those are just a, a few ideas coming out of this. Uh, but to help me unpack this, let me invite my panel uh, to um, turn on their videos and, uh, and the audio so I can introduce them and we can actually get going with the discussion. So um, first panelist we have is Dr. Sarah Alade. She's a special advisor to the president of Nigeria on finance and the economy. So welcome Dr. Alade. We also have Mohamed, Dor Mohamed Dorish, who's a co-founder of IHS Towers and the CEO of IHS Nigeria. We have Aida Diara, who's a senior vice president and group country manager for Sub-Saharan Africa for Visa and last but not least, Karim Sinhaji, who's the CEO of OCP Africa. So that's a great panel. We will, again, I'll ask, start with a few questions to the panel. And then, uh, then if you please send your questions as requested so we can uh, then make sure they answer as many of your questions as we can. So Dr. Alade, maybe I, let, let, let me start with you. Um, you know, Nigeria in particular, you know, like many African countries has been you know, quite hit by the crisis. We know this morning there were about 22,000 um, cases in the country. We know the country is probably going to go into another recession this year. Can you just give us a bit of a sense of how how badly hit has been has the economy been uh, uh, given the uh, because of the crisis? Thank you, Acha. Uh, oh, unfortunately, we have been hit in many fronts. The health issue is one that's the direct impact of the COVID nineteen itself in terms of illness, death, you're just mentioning the numbers that we have, which is still, which uh, you know, we haven't been able to flatten the curve yet. And uh, this has put a lot of pressure on our weak healthcare system. The, the healthcare system you know, could be better, is weak. And then we have uh, all these other expenditure too, in order to contain the uh, pandemic. Secondly, the, the response of government to the pandemic in terms of restricting movement has also affected uh, households. It's affected uh, livelihoods. People cannot go to work. We have a large informal sector that depends on working daily for what they used to, you know, to, to uh, support their families. Now they cannot do that. So we have a lot of uh, you know, households that have lost income and this definitely has contributed to the unemployment that we have in the country. Then lastly, the, the uh, global spread of the pandemic also led to the lockdown. And that has, uh, uh, you know, led, uh, that has uh, uh, resulted in the collapse of oil prices. And you know, Nigeria is uh, largely dependent on oil. So with the collapse of oil prices, which is the main honor of our foreign exchange and the major contributor to government's uh, revenue, the fiscal, uh, you know, fiscal of uh, government, the revenue is uh, in trouble, so to say. Uh, federal government revenue had dropped from 8.4 trillion Naira and now to about 5.6, it's about 30% uh, drop. We haven't seen the end of it yet. So we are just uh, 
hoping that it will not be too bad. We are also expecting that the GDP will contract by about 44%. So we have all these, uh, you know, being hit on all sides, so to yeah. say. Yeah, no, absolutely, right? I mean, we always say, you know, we think about one crisis when you talk about the corona crisis, but it's actually three crises, right? So it's, there's a global pandemic and that, you know, um, the way it manifests itself, like you said, it's, you know, our, our imports, disruption of our imports, but also lower demand for our exports. Like you said, you know, oil from Nigeria, but it could be cocoa from Ghana or cars from Morocco or flowers from Kenya. There's the Africa pandemic with the lockdowns, like you said, huge reduction in uh, household and business expenditure but also it's affected tourism. Tourism is eight and a half percent of uh, Africa's GDP. And in some island states like the Seychelles is 40% of GDP. And then there's an oil crisis. I remember I heard the Minister of Finance talk about how oil receipts were projected to, to go down by 90% in Nigeria, where oil accounts for about 60% of government revenue, right? So fundamentally uh, affected indeed. We'll come back again to what Nigeria is doing about that. But let's let's move to Mohammed. Mohammed, you're actually in the sector, the, the telco sector that generally people feel has not been that affected. We're all working from home, we're all using tons of data. Um, you know, can you talk a bit about, about how affected has, you know, your company IH has been, but what does IHS do? But also how affected has the telco sector been in general across Africa? Sure, Asha. So first, thanks for CCA for organizing this event and uh, also my regards to my fellow panelists uh, as, as well as you, Asha. So IHS, we are a telecommunication infrastructure provider. We own and operate around 30,000 uh, telecom towers across Africa, Middle East and Latin America. And um, probably around half or more than half are located in Nigeria. So you are right that no sector of the economy has been spurred by COVID. While many developed countries are recovering from the worst uh, of the pandemic, as you said, we unfortunately fear that Africa seems to be going through the peak now. Uh, when one sees the devastating impact of lockdown on the economies of the developed countries, you can just imagine how much worse it will be on Africa and countries like Nigeria, given the lack of financial uh, might. So, you know, even though the, the the IMF estimates that Nigeria GDP will shrink by 5%, Dr. Sara mentioned maybe 4%, but when you see their estimates for the US to be 8%, for Europe to be more than 10%, you really wonder if the impact on Africa and on Nigeria will unfortunately be worse uh, than this. So in reference to what Dr. Sarah said, yes, I mean, with the crash in oil prices, shortage of dollar inflows, compounded by the pandemic, a lot of sectors were badly hit, oil and gas, FMCG, to even manufacturing, which required access to dollars for importation of raw materials. So unless and until African economies diversify from reliance on natural resources, we will remain a dollarized economy that import most of what we consume and the health of our economies will be determined by the fluctuations uh, of the natural resources uh, prices. So back to your question, during the pandemic, there has been uh, slow invoice demand, but the uptake has been great on the data. Uh, the key challenges that, that the sector saw was disruption maybe in supply chain, um, access to dollars in certain economies in Africa, and slightly degradation in the security situation due to the lockdown. Um, where you see a lot of people have lost their, uh, their main source of income. So while a lot of companies, their staff could afford to work from home, other companies like IHS, we had a big number of our staff who had to be on the field uh, to go around the network and watch out for it, which I, I send my warm uh, regards to. So despite the challenges I have mentioned, the ICT sector is playing uh, a key role in promoting resilience during this period. And by saying that, you know, Asha, the concept of social distancing we are hearing is, is, is an anathema to, to who we are as humans. It's a contrary to what we are. So the ICT sector played a role in enabling, uh, one, enabling people to stay connected despite the, 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 the forced separation to provide an alternative to the to the halted transportation sector, to enabling organizations to continue with their business, uh, keeping people connected, let them uh, speak, chat on videos, etc., and so on. And even a lot of big questions like: Do we rethink the way we work 
post this pandemic, mm -hmm. given the facility mm -hmm. that the facilities that the ICT sector has provided, three enabling education sector to continue through online means. You know, to be honest, I didn't enjoy it with my kids much, um, much but to be fair, at least they. The, at least the, the, the online education ensured that they continue to get their studies uh, for probably Ida will speak better to this, but, but the platforms created by the ICT is what enabled financial services, e-commerce to flourish. Look at the Amazons of this world, what they have done to make sure that people's needs remain intact and sourced during this period. And lastly, I would say the health sector that Dr. Sarah mentioned, the telemedicine was critical in reducing non-emergency hospital visits so as to not to overwhelm the already congested uh, health facilities, which is something that we as I, at IHS, for example, has, uh, has, has greatly used. Yeah. No, thanks, thanks Mohammed. I, I do have one more question, but it's funny because, you know, one of my clients told me, you know, through this crisis, before the crisis, all the countries and we all realized the importance of the financial services sector. With the crisis, we really realized the importance of the telecom sector, right? So you talked about, you know, throughout the crisis, some of your staff had to work. It'd be interesting to understand what percentage of your staff actually continued working and what did you do to help protect them, you know, while they're working in the lockdown? So, you know, all of us, we were continued to work, I would say 60, 70 percent, actually more. So we have, we employ around 40,000 in direct and indirect staff across our operations. I would say the vast majority remain working on the field uh, to go around the network while the, the remaining were working from home for the administration uh, departments and so on and so forth. So for these guys on the field, it was very important to make sure that HSE safety, health is very protected for them in terms of providing them with PPEs equipment, continue the education tour uh, with them that what they have to do to make sure that they are not exposed to, 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 to the virus. A lot of uh, online um, training we did as well for them, um, just to make sure that they are away from those, uh, from those concerns. So as I said, unlike other companies, we did not have the luxury really to work at home. And a big number of those staff had to go through the through through the exposure with the outside world during this. But education, as I said, is was mostly important. That's how you educate people to 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 keep hygiene, social distancing, while we had to provide them with all sorts of PPE tools to to, to ensure their safety. No, thank you. And of course, when I said continue to work, I mean of course work in the field, right? I think you know many of us, of course, are working much harder than we did, you know, uh, when we were not working from home. Actually, another client of mine told me it feels less like working from home, but more like sleeping at the office. <laughs> so you figure how you avoid that. Um, let me turn to Ida. You mentioned Ida. You know, Ida, let's talk about payments, right? That's the space Visa is in. And on one hand, you, you know, people will say the crisis has accelerated the shift to electronic payments, right? You know, people don't want to use cash anymore. People are trying to, and you can even go out, right? So a lot of electronic payments. On the other hand, we've talked about the lower economic activity, the job losses, right? We project that they could be up to about 30% of all jobs in Africa uh, could, be, could, could be at risk. So these losses have clearly led to a contraction in, in payment revenues. So how has Visa been affected? How have the payments, the financial services, the payment space been affected by the crisis in Africa? Thank you, uh, Acha. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure for me to be uh, on this panel with you and uh, my co-panelists. And, uh, you know, as it has already been said, um, COVID-19 has disrupted economies and societies in ways that, um, you know, no one could have anticipated that. I'd like to share with you and the panel probably uh, two, three trends that we've seen in, uh, in uh, the payment industry. Um, the first one has to do with, to your point, with consumers not being in a position to go to retail stores and being confined at home, we've seen a surge of um, e-commerce transaction and transactions happening online. Um, you know, we've done a, a survey not too long ago with consumers and, um, you know, in markets like uh, Kenya, 54% of consumers we've talked to have told us, you know what, this is the first time throughout you know, the crisis that we've uh, used um, delivery, food delivery um, uh, online. Um, 
the same uh, survey was done in Kenya and in uh, you know, Nigeria, South Africa. South Africa, the number was 37% of new people, you know, consumers trying for the first time uh, uh, re, um, ordering uh, from, from, from the net. And uh, that number was 42 for, from Kenya. This is just to indicate that there certainly has been a trend towards e-commerce. You know, some of the retailers have even told us that they've seen an increase up to 400% of their e-com or web activity compared to pre-COVID-19 crisis. So there is an indication then that, you know, the, the transactions and the payments are going online. And the very interesting part, by the way, is that all of them we talked to said that even after the crisis, they will continue to transact online. So that's trend number one. The second trend that we've seen is you know, as we engage with merchants in uh, Central Europe, Middle East, and Africa, you know, 80% of the merchants have told us that they've seen a spike in their contactless transactions. And for us, this is an indication that we have a unique opportunity to accelerate uh, this technology. Um, you know, consumers and merchants are looking for easy ways to, to, to transact, and this is definitely one, one other way to do it. And probably the third trend that I will mention is, you know, with the usage of um, mobile wallets and mobile money, um, we are in a unique position to um, innovate and provide new solutions for payment, and especially in the context of uh, P2P uh, transactions, person-to-person -person transactions. So definitely challenges across the industry, but at the same time, we are seeing new opportunities arising. And uh, we believe that it is a unique time to digitize payments throughout the continent. No, um, thank you. I, I fully agree. You know, part of our, we just published a report in the afternoon on, on the impact of, of, of COVID on payments and exactly what you found. And that speaks to the first trend I talked about, you know, acceleration of digitization. So we'll come back to talk a bit about, you know, what you're doing uh, to make that happen uh, as, as part of Visa. But thank you for that. Uh, Karim, let's, let's turn to you, right? You know, as we know, agriculture is a bedrock of, of the African economy that counts for close to a quarter of our GDP, you know, as a continent. Um, you know, roughly sounds like we export, you know, about the latest numbers we saw was $40 billion worth of food and agriculture products out of the continent. But on the other hand, we also import about $50 billion worth of food and agriculture products, right? So we'd love to understand from you how has the uh, crisis affected the ag sector and how has it affected OCP? Thank you, Asha, for your question. I would like also to thank the CCA team for the invitation and uh, my warm regards to my fellow panelists. First of all, I would like maybe to give a brief presentation of OCP Group and its uh, African subsidiary, OCP Africa. So our company has a century of experience in the phosphate industry. OCP is integrated across the entire phosphate value chain from mining to processing and marketing phosphate and its derivatives, mainly fertilizer. And today, OCP is one of the world's largest fertilizer company and the only major one whose operation and, and home are based in Africa. So OCP Africa was created in 2016. And from that date, let's say, the group displayed several actions and program for the benefit of farmers by contributing to the development and the implementation of integrated agricultural ecosystems. And in partnership with the network of partners, including governments, nonprofit organizations, companies, OCP works continuously to provide agricultural solutions to farmers and that are locally relevant and sustainable. So today, OCP Africa is present, is present sorry, over than 18 African countries through the opening of subsidiaries or representative offices and projects. And we also promote the production of competitive fertilizer in the major agricultural ports. So coming back to, the, to your question, Asha, one could say that Africa is facing many daunting challenges with big repercussions on its socioeconomic development. We have a growing population expected to double by 2050, reaching 2.5 million uh, billion, sorry, inhabitants, 
And these demographic trends will create tensions on food security in the continent, as well as challenges in the job market. More employed, <clears throat> unemployed, sorry, youth will seek jobs and opportunities out of their communities and countries, resulting in regional migration, particularly from rural to urban areas. The climate change is also impacting the continent at a disproportionate rate. And the International Food Policy Research Institute, sorry, estimate that the continent will add an additional 38 million hungry people by 2050 due to the climate change. And as far as the COVID-19 pandemic is concerned, it has a severe impact on the continent and has exposed the limits of our current approaches. In most African countries where the food system are labor intensive, the shortage of workers due to restriction on the mobility of people has compromised both necessary input supply on the upstream and trade processing and transport activities on the downstream level. And as you mentioned, our dependence on extra regional food imports, and by the way, it's over than $50 billion, it's $70 billion mm -hmm. that we are importing as a finished uh, 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 good. And what we are exporting is mainly raw materials. And that situation <clears throat> that has made our countries more vulnerable to disrupt international logistics and distribution channels. So the issue we have faced, for instance, in Brazil or in Russia, that has a huge impact in Africa because we will not be able to import any more wheat and rice for a short period of time. And then we have seen the prices that just uh, uh, flow up. And, and these impacts actually are just further exacerbate a situation that is already characterized by high prevalence of malnutrition and poverty. And this is due to problems in uh, mainly rural areas, including low cost, in this <clears throat> low cost infestation, drought, conflict, and insecurity. So once again, I mean, this COVID-19 uh, uh, impact, it was on food security, it was on uh, uh, employment, especially for the youth people, because when you when you look at the, at the African uh, uh, job market, our economies are generating only 2 million former jobs per year, where we have an estimated 12 million youth entering the workforce in Africa every year. So we need to build resilience models. We need to build resilience economy in order to ensure that Africa's developed achievements are not lost when disasters or disruption hit the continent. And to finish, this crisis has also changed the paradigm and the triggered the need for a deep social economic reform in Africa and new development models. Models that will foster the diversification of our economies, boost the continental market, like the Africa free trade area, and more especially promote innovation and digitalization as a trigger of the growth in Africa. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. We'll come back and unpack many of those many of those points uh, in a bit. Maybe Dr. Alade, let me come back to you and let me encourage you know uh, all of our guests to feel free to again you know include include your questions in the chat function so we can actually come to your question. While waiting for that, Dr. Alade, um, you know we talked about the impact of the crisis on, on on the Nigerian economy. We know Nigeria has actually now launched an economic sustainability plan. Can you just talk a bit about some of the key, the key elements of the plan? What are the priorities of the plan? How are you going to finance it? And uh, what are you focusing on in the plan to really relaunch the economy? Dr. Alad, are you there? Oh, I think you're, you're muted. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. So thank you. Thank you very much. The economic sustainability plan has as its main uh, objectives, the stimulation of the economy by preventing business collapse. I mean, the whole idea is that whatever businesses we have, we want to ensure that they continue to produce. We also uh, intend to create jobs using 
uh, especially labor intensive uh, methods. And when we talk about that, you're looking at agriculture. When you look at the number of youths that we have, you know that creation of job must be a priority, you know, post COVID or even while we are going through uh, the COVID thing and trying to solve the problems. We also intend, the sustainability plan also intend to spend a lot on infrastructure. It's uh, not enough to get out of the uh, health issue and then um, we are not able to uh, contribute to economic uh, growth. So the infrastructure in the areas of uh, you know, uh, uh, job creation, those uh, sectors that we enhance uh, growth, the uh, sustainability plan is uh, planning to spend a lot on that. Promotion of uh, local manufacturing is another, so that uh, to some extent, the country can be, self, I mean, can be sufficient in some of the items that we need. We all I mean, have spoken the, the, about uh, what happened to imports, imports where locked, you can't have, you can import your healthcare, uh, items that you need because every other country needs it. And now this is one lesson, like uh, you said, Acha, that we have learned that to some extent, we should be self-sufficient in some of these items that we need. So promoting uh, local manufacturing is another. And uh, protecting the poor and the vulnerable in the society. This is also one of the priorities of the plan. So that those who are really not uh, able, the, 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 those who are affected, you know, the, the worst affected people in the society can be pro promoted. Funding is estimated that it will be about uh, 2.3 trillion Naira. That's about uh, $6 billion, I suppose. And uh, the, it, it will be coming from the banks and uh, coming from some government special accounts. And it's also the sustainability plan also has a, a framework for implementation. So it's not just going to be paper ideas. It's going to be a plan that will be implemented. And that implementation will have, a, it has a very robust uh, implementing implementation framework headed by ministers of uh, uh, ministries. They will see to the implementation. We have uh, project monitors a combination of government uh, uh, as well as a private sector teams to be able to monitor. You have uh, monitoring and evaluation teams. The budget office will also be involved in the monitoring of this project to ensure that uh, expenditure is both transparent and uh, you know, out there for all to see. So the, the sustainability plan takes care of uh, uh, you know, some of the concerns that we have been discussing today. Thank you. Yeah. No, thanks. Maybe one follow-up question, because uh, as part of this plan, I would love to hear a bit more on the SME form. You know, the SMEs are sort of the heart of many economies. Of the 90 million SMEs in Africa, about 40, or about half of them, about 45 million uh, are, are in Nigeria, right? And so would love to understand, and those are the most vulnerable. So you talked about how you're protecting the vulnerable populations. We'd love to understand a bit more, you know, how does this plan really help the SMEs in Nigeria? We have a lot of, um, you know, fiscal measures for, to, to help the um, MSMEs, you know, and that's, uh, that's why I started by saying that one of it is to protect jobs. They have a lot of things from our uh, Finance Act 2020. They have a lot of, uh, there, there's a loan for MSMEs that we have, they can assess loans. The sectors that have been badly hit for all those uh, uh, micro and small enterprises can access loans. There's a, there are loans that are you know, supporting them that is put out there by central bank and then by the banks to be able to assess funds to ensure that their businesses do not die. We, have, uh, uh, we also have loans for those even in the healthcare system to be able to set up businesses and so on. And they have a lot of uh, tax mm. measures that they could also enjoy. You know, the focus had been on encouraging MSMEs really, those who have the jobs to retain their jobs and then to create more. That's one of the things that uh, the sustainability plan 
Institute. Great, that's great to hear because we know the MSMEs, especially the ones in Nigeria need, need quite a bit of help. So it's great to hear that there are a number of programs in place to, to support them. Um, Mohamed, let's come back to you then on the telco space. You know, we talked about now the real importance of this sector for economies. Um, you know, what, what, what if you now project forward, let's start looking more forward, right? And think about, you know, reimagining what this sector could look like around the crisis. What's your outlook for the sector? What would it take for it to emerge even stronger and to actually continue to support uh, the growth of other sectors across our economies? Uh, so, you know, my view of the future of the telecom sector is the same pre-pandemic and uh, post-pandemic. Mm -hmm. Simply put, very positive. I mean, if I can just take us like 20 years back to when the private sector, to when the telecom sector was privatized in Nigeria, a lot of people said the growth would be five years and then we saturate. And I, and I do remember a story that a private, that uh, a license was offered to an international operator to come into Nigeria and they turned it down, believing that in five years, 10 years, that the Nigerian telecom market is a 5 million subscriber people. Look where we are right now. So crowded, 200 million, uh, 160 million subscribers. And the growth is still phenomenal and massive. And when I remember 20 years ago, and when people saying this is a five year, 10 year thing, we are 20 years now, and we are still nowhere close to where we are supposed to, it tells me that the, the future is still still bright. So for example, the World Economic Forum has already has also predicted that by 2022, 60% of the world's economy would be driven online. So COVID is only going to increase that percentage. Uh, if I look at the telecom sector in Nigeria, again, I think it was probably the only sector that was growing during the recession and among the best performers post the recession. Um, but then that's again attract its own issues of multiple taxation and this and that, but that's for another uh, discussion. So I've already outlined, for example, how the ICT sector enables other sectors. So the policy environments that will enable and strengthen the telecom sector will also deliver significant results in the other sectors and the digital economies of the future. So this term digital economy that you even touched based on Asha and your starting remarks. So it's, it's basically conducting most economic activities through online connections between people, devices, data. Um, and that and the implication of that transformation will really go beyond to include social interactions, education, governance. And as I said before, so we can achieve all of that by improving broadband connectivity, 5G, internet of things, artificial intelligence. I saw one question was asking about AI, cloud computing, and the list go, goes on and goes on. And each one of these things is really a word by itself. So for example, while other countries started deploying 5G, we in Africa don't even have proper 4G coverage, not even to talk about a lot of people in rural areas and rural villages who don't even have a basic phone coverage uh, in those areas. Take IoT, for example, imagine a world that is fully connected, every machine talking to every other machine and them making decisions on their own without really involving us in that process. How do you ensure education gets to these millions and tens of millions of children across Africa who unfortunately um, um, probably two thirds are girls. You do that by online education. How do you improve agriculture? Like what Karim mentioned before, we, for example, we install units on our sites that actually gather a lot of weather reports that we share with the farmers in, in, in Nigeria. Imagine if that is an automated system. Imagine that the farmers have that information automatically and they make their own decisions based on that. And those decisions are also automated in terms of the process. Um, women, pe people with disabilities uh, and starting their own SMEs. You've spoken about SMEs and that's a very important thing for Africa. Most of businesses in Africa are SMEs and that's where a big part of the employment is driven. Those two, three people, the neighbors who start a small shop or they start a photo, a photo session or they want to sell some products like for IHS. I, we see a lot of people even in IHS who knock our doors 
two, three, four people who want to build the site here, who want to provide some material in, for example, Borno State and the in, in that area who want to provide security situation there. So, and the beauty about these SMEs is that they are sometimes they are localized. So they understand the environment, they understand the terrain, they provide you better servers. They have that energy that they want to make it, you know, they, 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 they want to prove themselves. They want they still have that energy you see. So, so sometimes in IHS, I feel, you know, it's better for us to deal with such people because they provide you with focus services, they provide you with the energy and the attention. Uh, can, can Africa go there? Can we get to artificial intelligence? Can we get to IoT? Can we get to 5G? All of these, definitely we can how we who will get us there is the ic sector is everybody but how do we get there in my mind two things needed number one investment in the sector is needed and investment is available Aisha, for example we ihs a infrastructure provider in africa have invested more than five billion dollars over the past five years in this continent but for that money to come and that money to be abundantly available, we need an enabling environment. We need an environment where government policies are made to protect businesses and ensure their sustainability. Then businesses will do the work. There have been few talk this session about private sector and privatization. If I look at the power sector in Africa, if I look at the roads situation in Africa, if I look at the aviation sector in Africa, if I look at the healthcare, the education, all of these, they need, they need an overhaul. Look at the telecom sector in Nigeria, see what it has accomplished by privatization, the right way of privatization. So what I believe is opportunities is there. Africa has the potential. Africa can be where we are supposed to be. Investment is there. A lot of people are willing to put that money in Africa, but I think we just need to create that enabling environment that protect businesses and investments that would encourage people to really come. I have been in Africa for 20 years and I'm not, I, don't, I don't have plans of leaving that place because the opportunities are there. You just need to have a balance between the risk and return uh, for such transactions. Well, thank you. So talking about, you know, telecom as an enabling sector, I like that, right? And enabling all the other ones, whether it's education, whether it's healthcare, whether it's agriculture. And for that to happen, you said, you know, investment and enabling environment, right? Those are two things that need to happen. So we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that, you know. Um, Aida, um, let's talk about um, uh, uh, the payments, again, the payments space, right, with the, with the, with the crisis. And, uh, and in part, we've spoken a lot about SMEs, right? We've spoken a lot about SMEs. They're the most vulnerable, as we know. Um, so what, what specifically, and I know Dr. Alabi spoke even about the programs the government has, but what from your vantage point, and you deal with a lot of these SMEs, um, what can be done best done to support them, right? And, and what role is Visa playing in, in, in this area? Thank you, uh, uh, Asha. And uh, to your point, I echo everything that has been said around uh, SME uh, in, uh, in Africa. Um, they play a key role in our economy. Um, you know, they represent 90% of businesses in Africa. Um, we refer to, to them as representing 38% of Africa GDP. And, um, you know, from, from our perspective, um, we really need to uh, have a collective um, uh, role in, in empowering and, and creating resilience for SMEs in, in the region. Um, you know, in normal times, SMEs will tell you, 60% of them will tell you that their biggest challenge is to have access to finances. This is in normal times, pre-COVID-19. Now think about the impact that uh, this crisis has had uh, on them. So at PISA, we believe that you know, we need to work with all the stakeholders in the payment ecosystem to make sure that we enable them to remain resilient. And in order for them to, to, to get there, there are certain critical factors, yeah? So first, there's gotta be an environment that is conducive of, you know, innovation, especially in the do domestic uh, uh, payment ecosystem just to make sure that all partners you know, can join forces to drive you know, innovation at that level. So I believe this is like the first step. 
The second critical element is really all what the governments are doing, and Dr. Alade talked about it. It's about you know, what is happening with the uh, Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement that, for example, enable e-commerce. Um, this is fundamental. It's also about formalizing the SMEs and giving them a chance to enter the formal ecosystem and enabling the digital payment service providers to onboard them. This is gonna be key moving forward. So at these, you know, we've, um, we've made a commitment um, to be part of the journey and play a critical role in that digitalization. Um, you know, we believe that number one, it is critical to make sure that these businesses have access to resources to enable them to go online, you know, to digital. How do I bring my business online? Because this is the trend that we're seeing across the industry. Started before COVID-19, it has just accelerated during this time. And, and we're making these resources available to them on, you know, our um, small businesses uh, hub. The second thing that we believe is important is to remind consumers that they are empowered to support their local businesses as well. So we launch a Where You Shop Matter campaign across um, several markets in the region and, and really remind uh, consumers that they, they, they have a, a responsibility and they are empowered again to um, positively impact the business in their local environment. And then we want to make sure that, um, you know, with the support of the foundation, we partner with NGOs and also with investor, you know, in, in investing companies to really bring capital to support uh, small businesses. And uh, we've pledged to make a $200 million uh, uh, commitment and support to SMEs across the globe over five years. And um, with all the uh, elements that I shared with you earlier, we believe um, that we will be able to enable 50 million SMEs across, across the globe and really empowering them uh, to enter uh, the digital journey. It is a, a commitment that we, we all should have. And it's gonna take, again, working with the banks, working with the FinTechs, working, you know, leveraging the MNOs um, and, and the support of the governments as well to make sure that uh, we embark in the, into that digital journey and we accelerate it. You know, you have markets like Seychelles, for example, who have made the decision to increase the limit of contactless transaction without PIN, you know, just because they saw how critical it was to foster you know, digital transaction. And this is only one example. And uh, more than ever, we are ready um, to, to be part of the journey and be a catalyst of that trend. Awesome, so thank, thank you for the role you're playing because I think this is actually critical. We are actually doing some work with AUD and NetPad and EcoBank and a number of stakeholders around trying to come up with the bold response for MSMEs across Africa, right? And, and as we think about it, you know, we think the three things they need, the, there's access to markets, there's access to capabilities, and there's access to finance. And it's great to see that your program really touches on all of these, all, all of these three. So, uh, so, so, uh, so, so thank you for that. Um, Karim, let me come to you and then, then the number of questions from the audience, we'll start taking those. Um, you, you talked about some of the challenges and the access, you talked about, you know, the um, you know, challenges even importing wheat and rice on the continent. We'd love to understand you know, what's your outlook for the sector going forward? And what do we need to do uh, to, to come out of this with a much stronger agriculture sector for the continent? Yeah. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, uh, agriculture is a key lever to build the resilience. And I already say that we need a resilient model. And if we want to generate growth, achieve food security, agriculture is really the key lever. And uh, fortunately, our continent agriculture has a tremendous potential. Actually, Africa holds 65% of the world and used arable land. And we have also <clears throat> ample water supplies in many parts of the continent. And more importantly, we have over than 60% of Africa labor force, which is employed in agriculture. 
But on the other side, <clears throat> our agriculture is facing many obstacles to its development. And as I said earlier, new models adapted to the continent specificities are essential. Those models must ensure an increase in the agricultural productivity through ensuring access to affordable, good quality input, customized and locally produced, such as fertilizer or seeds, as well as raising awareness on good agricultural practices and digitalization. My fellow panelists have talked about that. Digitization is one of the key uh, uh, success factor if we want to, uh, to transform our, our uh, agriculture, and I, I will talk about it later on. Those new models will have also to support local transformation of agricultural, uh, agricultural sorry, outputs for more value creation and promoting should, short food secrets. We have seen during this uh, pandemic that uh, many developed countries, maybe not related to, to the food, but for other products such as the, the mask that they need to protect themselves, they were all dependent on the production in China. And many others uh, think we have seen uh, during this pandemic is also correlated to that. So being able to produce, at least when it comes to, 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 um, to food, to produce locally, this is also something essential. And those new models that we need to design and develop, they need to ensure, we have to make sure that they will support the local transformation. You have also mentioned the, the importance of SMEs. And I also agree on that. And you have many SMEs working in the agricultural sectors and we have to design uh, uh, models that will help them to, to achieve, not only by giving them uh, uh, financial means, but we have also to create market from them. We have also to create a kind of ecosystem around smaller farmers and those SMEs in order to make them <clears throat> able to grow and uh, as a result to contribute to the transformation and the growth of the continent. And I would like also to think of, to, ta to talk, sorry, about something very important when it comes to food in, in Africa, because we need to promote Africa historic low water consumption and high fever crops. I mean, if you look back 50 years ago, African will not consuming rice. Rice was important by uh, people out of Africa. So this is something we have also to change our consumption habits and to go back to those like uh, the, uh, uh, to those crops that are consuming low water, as I said, and, 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 and keep more uh, fibers and, uh, uh, and, more, and are more rich in terms of uh, uh, calories. And finally, we have also to, <clears throat> to support, enhance the industrial synergies and the complementarities among African countries. And in that spirit, all the, the, the industrial project that we have uh, between OCP and the government of Ethiopia, for instance, or the government of Nigeria and Ghana to, uh, to, um, to build uh, a fertilizer plant in those countries, this is a kind of synergies we have to promote based on each country uh, uh, natural resources or each country assets. So this is one of, let's say, the, 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 the needs in order to transform our agriculture. But for me, the more important uh, uh, key uh, uh, lever is the, uh, the capacity building. We will not be able to transform our agriculture and this transformation will not be sustainable if we are not educating and training our youth. If we are not creating specific program dedicated to the science of agriculture. And in that spirit, <clears throat> OCP have created a university called University Mohammed VI Polytechnic. And this institution is focusing on applied research and innovation and is oriented towards Africa. We have also <clears throat> a big department of R&D and, and I do believe that this is also something very important and we are not focusing on it as we should, as far as the agriculture is concerned. Mm. We need R&D in agriculture. If you look at what is happening in the US, for instance, or in other countries that have very strong agriculture, the R&D part of it is one of the key uh, success factors. 
And then we have also to promote innovation and entrepreneurship. We need to support our, our youth. We need to have strong innovator and entrepreneurial ecosystem in order to make our youth entrepreneurs able to solve the problem that the continent will face. And that we can also be able to create jobs. I've mentioned in my introduction that jobs creation will be also an issue to, uh, to, to face and to overcome. And by supporting innovation and entrepreneurship, we will, help it, we will be able to do so. Got it. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, a lot of things that need to be done. I like the whole, you know, eat what we produce, right? Make sure we do that. And then the whole R&D space and innovation and entrepreneurship. We have a lot of questions from the audience. So let me try to take a few. Uh, Dr. Alili, let's start with you. There is a question about how you talked about, you know, promoting local manufacturing and import substitution. Um, there was a big question around, you know, Nigeria has tried that before, not always very, in some cases successful, in others not. So what is Nigeria going to do differently to make sure that this time, promoting local uh, local manufacturing actually works in the country. Dr. Ali, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Sorry, just trying to unmute myself. No um, we, uh, you know, it, it's uh, one thing, one lesson we have learned from this pandemic is that it um, has become absolutely necessary to be able to do some things by ourselves. And uh, I'm glad Mohammed also mentioned the need to be able to provide some of the food that we eat. Now you can imagine if uh, we depend solely on import of food. During the pandemic, every country will take care of its own people first and exports of food export of food, uh, the, the face mask, PPE, and so on, we're banned. So if we are not able to, if we have to store, I mean, if we have to wait on other countries, for instance, to provide something as simple as face mask for us, I'm sure in the short term we are all dead because they will be using their face mask. They are not exporting it because we do. So I think we have done it in the past, yes, to say import substitution does not work, but uh, uh, Karim also talked about some of the reasons why they didn't work. The enabling environment for these things were not there. We also have access to financing. Rates of uh, interest rates in Nigeria is very high if you want to go into manufacturing as well. So some of these things are things that we are trying to address this time. If you have a market for 200 million people, to be able to do something that you consume. Now we have seen that it does not always pay to, to depend on other countries for everything that you need. You can, if, if, it's, if the pandemic were not COVID-19, let's assume it was malaria and we're susceptible to malaria and every single um, malaria, anti-malaria tablet that we have will have to come from other countries. I mean, now we won't be talking of uh, how, how many people would have been dead because we can't produce it. So there are certain things that we have to, I'm not saying everything that we import we will be able to, but there are certain essential things that uh, we must be able to produce. And uh, once we can put in place an enabling environment for this, allow people to have access to finance, and then I think the rest will be doing. Now we are even doing rural, we are doing roads to make sure that connectivity will be easier. You can move food from one part of the country to the other or move any other item from one part of the country to the other. So we're doing that. And uh, we should be able to provide, like I said, some of the things that we need, not all. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. No, thank you. I mean, another, I probably maybe just to build on that, because there was another question related, which is, as part of it is also we need to, as a country, attract foreign direct investment, especially in a sector like the oil and gas sector. So one question that that was raised was, you know, how competitive is Nigeria today? We know that what's going to happen, we're going to see, you know, a lot more competition between countries with the limited resources. So how competitive is Nigeria in the oil and gas space? And what does Nigeria need to do to become even more competitive in this post-COVID world? We, in the oil and gas space, we are doing a, we're doing a lot. And uh, one of the things is to be able to even bring down the cost of production of this oil from what it is. We have one of the highest in the world. We're doing things to be able to, to reduce the, the cost of production. 
we are doing a lot to ensure that there's security in, uh, in, 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 the, in that area. We are doing a lot to ensure that those who produce, the foreign investors that produce in Nigeria, don't have too much to complain about. So we are becoming more competitive. There is a lot of reforms that is going on. And by the time these reforms are done, then Nigeria will be very, very competitive in all these other sectors. These are all structural reforms that we are taking on headlong. And uh, we are not sort of underestimating them. We know they are critical to inviting, uh, to getting foreign direct investment into the country. And uh, we are doing, uh, you know, what we can to make mm. sure that uh, we remain on top of the game. All right, a number of reforms, but including, you know, reducing the cost of production, which I think which having spent a lot of time looking at the sector in Nigeria is actually something that, 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 that needs to be done. So. <laughs> Thank you for that. Aida, maybe we come to you because there are a number of questions here on sort of SME, women-led SMEs. One question around, you know, what are the kind of winning policies or practices you've seen on the public sector, on the private sector side to make sure that these SMEs, especially the women-led ones, have access to, um, to you know, to uh, procurement opportunities as people diversify the supplier base. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, thank you for, for the question. Um, it starts with number one, um, creating a, a forum and an opportunity where people when, and, and entrepreneurs, be it women entrepreneurs or uh, male entrepreneurs have access to resources to enable to, to help them grow their business. You know, the closer we get to, um, to them, we realize that, as I said earlier, uh, access to finance uh, to grow their business is a challenge. Um, tools to formalize their business is, is fundamental. Um, structure to put in place by the regulatory framework to make easier for them to, to get, you know, to enter the formal uh, financial ecosystem are uh, fundamental. And this is why we believe that, you know, as Visa, we have a role to play in making sure that we create this forum for make, to make a resource available to, to SMBs. And I talked about that a little bit earlier. We believe that we also should um, uh, partner with all the stakeholders you know, in our ecosystem, like you know, governments to put in place you know, the, the right policies and uh, uh, structures in place that would foster uh, more enablement of these fintechs and giving them access, again, not only to um, uh, finances, but also to um, um, uh, formal uh, uh, um, uh, uh, support, yeah, resources uh, and uh, financial um, support. So it is a combination of these factors that are gonna play a key role. We believe also that certainly loans, uh, and partnership with N NGOs are gonna be fundamental because this is where I believe the rubber meets the road, yeah? And uh, this is in line with the commitment that, uh, that we've done. Um, but the one thing that I wanna re-emphasize here, Asha, is, you know, as we look at, you know, the more resilient um, uh, SMEs today in the context of the crisis, and we see which one of the ones who have been bouncing back or resisting better to the crisis. These are the ones who have truly embraced digitization of their, uh, you know, their flows and their activities and digitization of their payments. And this is why I relentlessly come back to this because we believe that this is gonna be a, a key factor moving forward. Absolutely. And for me, not just SMEs, we found that the companies and the countries, by the way, that have been you know, more digitally advanced have fared so better, right? And we think that actually Very. going forward, as we talk about foreign investment, one of the criteria foreign investors are going to look at is how digitizes the country, because, you know, we will have another pandemic someday. The question is just when. Absolutely. That's, uh, that's one. One thing you didn't talk about is, uh, is uh, credit, credit rating systems. And there's a question about, is that a space visa plays in at the moment and what are you doing with that in Africa? This is definitely uh, a space where we see um, 
an opportunity for acceleration and growth in Africa altogether. Um, it is a segment where, you know, for different reasons, be it from uh, an understanding on how credit works or from limitation that uh, uh, governments are putting in place, um, um, preventing the expansion of, of credit altogether. Um, there is an opportunity again to accelerate um, 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 this space for, in the payment ecosystem. Um, it is about um, creating the uh, awareness and uh, the education around the benefit of it. And then it's also again making sure that the policies in place uh, uh, foster such a such solution. Just to give you an example, in some of the markets um, in the region, um, the regulator warrants that credit is associated or tied to a bank account. Um, and this is not necessarily um, a mandatory requirement for it to be efficient, right? So there's got to be ongoing dialogue and, and uh, engagement to make sure that uh, all stakeholders, you know, feel comfortable with the framework in place and allow uh, further credit solutions um, to be made available to, to consumers and, and uh, players in the ecosystem. Perfect, thank you. Thank you for that, Aida. Uh, Mohammed, let, let's come to you. Let's talk, let's shift a bit on, uh, and talk more on this question about, you know, AI and digital transformation. You spoke quite a bit about the role the telco sector can, can play in that space. The clearly uh, opportunities and big benefits as we discussed but like somebody mentioned you know, in the chat, there's some risk, right? There's risk on jobs and there's some other risk, you know, on, on security, uh, personal security issues. You know, you know, from your perspective, how do we balance that, you know, the opportunity versus the risk that, that these, um, these uh, uh, AI and digital transformations create for the country? That, that is a misperception, you know, even we remember some time ago when robotics, for example, were introduced, a lot of people were worried, okay, what about the jobs that we're going to lose to robotics when they start moving into production lines and manufacturing floors and so on and so forth. And what we have realized is that, yes, maybe there are a few jobs that will be directly impacted, but then the robotics themselves are creating a massive job um, employment on the side. You need companies to produce these robotics, you need companies to design them, you need there will be so many other consultants, advisors who will think about their work, how they operate and so on and so forth. So there is always a job creation that goes on the back of that. So artificial intelligence, for example, yes, is when you start asking the machines to do the thinking rather than, uh, rather than you do that. Um, does that mean you're gonna lose maybe the job of the person who's sitting down and trying to do the thinking, the output probably, or the whole purpose of this AI is to make sure that the output is, is, is more efficient, um, that the output has a better quality maybe even. Uh, once again, we look at the direct impact of that on the job uh, market, but we, but we also, don't see that the creation of that technology recruits a lot of jobs, that the expansion of that technology, where can it go, the creation of that technology of new fields or sectors or, or jobs or companies or opportunities, that's where also the other jobs are being created to, 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 to help AI. But, but yes, security-wise also, you have to be careful about the security of data and information, all of that, but all that is insured. Look now at cloud computing. A lot of people were afraid, oh, am I going to put my data at the cloud? Look at what happened with that company. I don't want to mention in the US when they start having leakages and this and that. No, my data is not protected. Yeah, maybe those are certain uh, cases that happen, but then there are tons of other cases of where that cloud cloud uh, storage or cloud computing or um, cloud data centers have really made things efficient for companies and, 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 and people and individuals and so on and so forth. So it's nothing risk-free. You create a technology, there is some risk associated with it. That's why you need to, to, to look at that and to cover it from all aspects. 
um, I am much more comfortable with cloud and all of that than I used to be like maybe a long time ago when it was introduced. Um, you just need to make sure that that technology you are creating does that. Unfortunately, in Africa, we are always behind when it comes to these technological advances, maybe because of the investment needed, maybe because of the, the concerns we have on the security element. That's a key thing, how we, how we look at things in Africa, maybe because we don't have the enabling environment, the enabling infrastructure to just put that technology on, um, unlike other countries in Europe or the US, for example. Um, but I also saw one question about like a, like a major data center in Africa. You know, great ideas. Are they practical? I don't know. Would the governments in Africa agree where to put that data center? Would they open their borders so that fiber can be laid down and everything can be connected with everything, the MNOs, the government? Uh, but I know, for example, in Nigeria, the banking sector have to have their own data center. This have to have, the MNOs like to have their own data centers. So you need a massive mentality shift you need people to think differently with these technological advances. They exist, but they're not going to provide the solution on their own. You need the governments, you need the people, you need the user to start thinking that, you know what, these technological advances will eventually uh, provide the solutions that we need, even though there could be some, some issues at the start of, uh, of it. Thank you, Mohammed. And you're absolutely right. You know, we did a piece of work looking at, you know, we call it future of work, and we looked at it around the world. And we did the analysis for South Africa in particular, and we're looking to expand it to Africa to understand. If you look at the impact of the fourth industrial revolution, you think of the impact of automation on jobs. What would that be? So jobs lost. But then on the other side, what kind of jobs are you going to gain, right? And everywhere we've looked at, including in South Africa, we found that you could gain many more jobs than you lose, to your point, right? Now, the trick, though, is we need to be pre prepared to gain those jobs, right? So how do we make sure that we understand what jobs will come out of it? How do we prepare people? What kind of training programs you need to put in place? What kind of sectors you need to put in place? How does the government and private sector work together to help prepare people for the jobs? Because I think the risk is if we don't do that, we'll get all the jobs lost, <laughs> but very few of the jobs gained. So I think that's part of, part of the, the, the challenge. Um, let's, let's talk, Karim, the, you know, again, some questions on the ag front, of course, uh, coming to you. Uh, you know, we talked about food production, we need to produce more ourselves. And then as Africa tried to, you know, make sure we have the logistics to get these across the continent, the storage facilities. Uh, how well prepared are we for that as a continent, right? We tend to export to other regions or we tend to import from other regions, but not do much in terms of, you know, export and import within the continent. So what, how well prepared are we for that? And what's it going to take for us to, uh, to get a lot more uh, of the Pan-African uh, trade going on, in the agriculture front? I mean, as I mentioned earlier, we, we have noticed some, some, some progress, but of course we are not there yet. And uh, uh, the, the, common, the common issue I, I, I'm, I'm looking at or are facing is that we are still, um, except the big countries such as uh, Nigeria or Ethiopia, where the market is that big that they can focus for, first on, on their own country before going uh, in the neighboring countries. But although their countries, Maybe their, their, their local market is too small. So this is why <clears throat> the uh, Africa free trade uh, uh, area is important. We need to, 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 to start improving the uh, intra-Africa trade. When you look at the figures, I mean, the African intra-trade is something between 10 and 11%, where in Europe, for instance, is above 70%. And in America, it's also that, that figures. So, and we need to, we, to start there because you're right. Maybe we don't have the enough storage capacity. Maybe we don't have the infrastructure. Maybe we don't have the, the transportation means, but we need to start somewhere. And this is what we have tried to do uh, since 2016 by having this small uh, ecosystem approach where we have all the uh, actors of the supply chain. We have the farmers, we have the uh, input providers, finance institutions, insurance, and more importantly, the uh, output buyer, the guy who will buy at the end of the day, the production, and we try to transform it. And by having those small projects, and we have done many in, in, in Nigeria, in Ghana, in Ethiopia, and it's very successful because then you, you notice that the farmers increase its productivity by more than 40%. 
and of course he is also increasing their revenues but we are still doing this at a small scale we are talking about project with less than 60,000 70,000 farmers when you know that in Africa we have more than 800 million farmers so the point here is how we can scale up this and when you want to scale up then you need it's much more complex of course and you need big players to enter in and big players first we have to talk to african players but we can also talk to american players i think that we have a lot to 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 learn from them we have a lot to share with them so my point here is that we are not ready on the field but first we need to be all to agree on how we can work together how we can design those models because don't get me wrong i'm not saying that one model will be perfect for all the countries and all the uh, the crops uh, we, we have in, in in africa i think that the approach is we have to sit down to have people that are there as soon as you have companies that are at one point they're risking the the, the project or they're risking what we want to do all the others are also coming joining and we do things and by having this collective intelligence having this the way of working all together then we can start doing things that will have big impacts but first for me if we want to be successful in that the, the, the key element is the the, the ppp the, the the private uh, public uh, partner sector we need to work closely between the private sector and the public sector so far it's either the governments that are trying to do things for agriculture or the private sector trying to do things also alone uh, in his side. We need to bring all those people. We need to bring also a uh, 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 non-profitable organization and, and many other uh, foundations and so on and so forth. But for me, it's a collective approach that needs to be done. And we have to sit down and start designing, thinking and implementing. And once again, one project will not be successful everywhere, but I believe that the approach that we are having is the one that we should use in, in, in all the uh, uh, countries of our continent. Thank you. Let me ask maybe one final question to Dr. Alade, then I'll come back to each of you for your closing statements. And this is about healthcare. So we know, you know it's first and foremost a health crisis. So the question about, you know, when you look at the economic sustainability plan, you know, how much of healthcare is a focus in the plan, investment in healthcare, especially in primary healthcare centers. Can you just talk a bit about, you know, how much the plan focuses on that uh, uh, to come out of crisis? Thank you. The healthcare, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, support for the healthcare, given what we have seen. Part of it is, um, uh, funding of the pharmaceutical sectors to be able to produce local drug. I just mentioned uh, malaria and some of these other things that we need. So there's a uh, funding, there's uh, access to finance for them to be able to uh, procure equipment and raw materials so that these things can be produced locally. We have also seen uh, uh, other things apart from pharmaceuticals investment now, we'll be going into our primary health care and some of our hospitals, even the teaching hospitals that we have. There's uh, money or there's fund that will be available to be able to upgrade the centers. I mean, we, we, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from this uh, COVID thing. We have seen how weak our healthcare system is and uh, to be able to upgrade them to something, just like, uh, uh, like you said a while ago, the, the question is when next is the, I mean, when is the next pandemic? When next are we going to have this kind of problems? And then we are then caught again, uh, not fully prepared. So we do have funds available. The, the economic sustainability plan is looking at that sector fully for the, from pharmaceutical to Others wanting to even establish private clinic, we are asking them for there, there's a whole hundred billion for for that sector for those who want to go into hospitals, private sector, not necessarily even uh, government. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all my panelists. So as we close, I have one question for all of you. Right. I'd just like to hear it as a is your closing statement? It's you know if we you know we're in the middle of the pandemic. There's all the negativity, the number of cases, number of jobs losses. We've talked quite a bit about what's going to take, uh, uh, you know, to emerge from this stronger. How optimistic are you that we're going to get there? Right. So maybe Mohammed, I'll start with you, and then go through this. So how optimistic are you? Very optimistic. It's not the first time that Africa faces a challenge. Uh, it's not going to be the last time. Um, the, the, the difference this time is that this challenge has affected everybody in the world. You know, I, I was always amazed by the U.S. being land of opportunities and the American dream, and you can go and do whatever you want in the U.S. Then I look at Africa and you see the challenges that we have. You see the lack of infrastructure. You see the, the, the lack of the basic needs that people require or their own power or access to clean water or, or security or, or, or. But, you know, I always say that these challenges create opportunities. These challenges create venues for improvement. Um, these challenges create hope for people that for a better future, especially with the telecom sector have opened up the eyes for everybody to see how everybody else in the world is living. When you, as an African, you, you go online and you see how somebody in Germany or in the US is living and going around, you start requesting from your government for change and you ask for improvements and you start saying, why not me? So that's, I think, was key to, to create that di dialogue. And as I said earlier, investment is there. People see the potential in Africa. All what they need for is an enabling environment and a protected environment that they will feel that, yes, we can put our money here, we will make our returns, and then we will be able to take it, take it back. Policies have to be put to ensure that those those, 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 I think, principles are there. And trust me, Asha, Africa, as I said earlier, I don't see a reason why we can't be where we have to be, uh, where we have to be. Awesome. Love it. Very optimistic. Aida, same question to you. How optimistic are you? I am tremendously optimistic, Asha. I am... Um, I am amazed at the resilience that uh, we have demonstrated throughout this crisis. Um, you know, there isn't a single partner I speak to who is not, you know, thinking ahead, forward looking, and looking at how they will transform and looking at, you know, turning these difficult times into future opportunities. You know, in, specifically in our industries, we see uh, some new entrants coming in with amazing technology. You know, the fintechs are coming in offering amazing solutions, both to issuers, to banks, to merchants, creating second to none uh, capabilities. We were talking earlier about credit, but do you know that we have fintechs that now can determine the credit worthiness or the work of, of someone due to the usage of their mobile you know phone creating amazing amazing you know opportunities so for me it is truly about how do we get africa ready uh, for digitization how do we enable further you know digitized payment but this can only happen if we come together as an industry Right, and we create the proper framework, we enable the stakeholder in this space to embark into that journey. And uh, we are more than ever committed to do so. And um, the trend started before COVID-19, it is accelerated and there's no stop. We, we can't go backwards and uh, it is an exciting time ahead for, for Africa in that space. Awesome, thanks Aida. Karim. Your thoughts? I mean, yeah, there is no point to, to ask this question. I'm definitely optimistic. I think that the question here is how, the, how do we learn from what is happening, uh, how we take lessons from that, and uh, we take actions. Uh, I mean, as far as we are concerned and, and the agriculture is concerned, since the pandemic started, we have seen many countries where we are used to operate that they have really changed uh, the way they were approaching the agriculture, even though before 
it was the case, but during the pandemic, uh, just one, one figure to mention, I mean, th there were this uh, Maputo uh, uh, agreement, it was, I think in 2000, around 2000, and the, all the head of state have agreed to dedicate 10% of their budget to the agriculture. And it was not rich. I think the maximum was something like five to 6%. And during this pandemic, I don't have the final figures, of course, but according to all the, 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 uh, the communication and, and, and the exchange I had, I presume that we are probably around 11 to 12 because that was a necessity because uh, the food security was the first priority to, 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 to solve. So my point here is at the end, what this pandemic have done is the, the pandemic put us in a situation where we had to react and to react quickly. And what have been done is a quick reaction, but also a collective reaction. And this is exactly what I, what I was talking about is the, the public sector was talking to private sector and, and, and we have all the, the, the main stakeholder of, the, of all the value chains in, in the agriculture staff starting talking to each other, having uh, webinars, conference and all these things. And we have made things happening. I mean, I have an example in mind. It's the, uh, what we call the plan uh, urgencerie in, in Ivory Coast. Uh, now we are working and, and, and they had an issue uh, regarding the uh, the rice uh, stocks, and we will be able now to produce the equivalent of twenty percent of the year uh, country consumption. This has never been done before, so the pandemic pushed us to find solution in order to 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 overcome and to overpass that. So. Once again, I, I, I'm, I'm fully convinced that uh, we will be able to make it. But once again, for me, the more important thing is, of course, as I said, the capacity building. We have to invest a lot in our youth population. We have to look at R&D. And also we have maybe to take advantage from this, this, uh, this panel and this seminar and the organization to ask also the US company to start coming and, and investing and, and helping us in order also to design and implement what we need, uh, we need uh, to do. We have to first, of course, start within Africa, but we cannot make it without uh, all the others. And being in this uh, CCA, I think it's also uh, uh, an opportunity for us to call for, a, let's say, uh, uh, initiative or project that could be run by Africans and Americans. Perfect. And last but not least, Dr. Alade, I was like, like any other Nigerian, you're optimistic. <laughs> Thank you. You know, oh, uh, I'm very, very optimistic, very optimistic. And um, I believe that what we are doing now to confront the problem is, uh, you know, safeguarding government revenue. In Nigeria, a lot of things we're doing is to make sure we block link leakages and uh, enhance uh, the, the, the government revenue that we have. We are also safeguarding lives and safeguarding livelihood. With faithful or, or effective implementation of these policies, we will definitely come out of it. Maybe not even as bad as, uh, as we think if we do, we do that. And I also believe that if we have, uh, if we continue with some of the structural reforms, the policy reforms that we have, we will be able to attract foreign direct investment. It's not as if we can go through, we can pull through, you know, we do need foreign direct investment and um, we will be able to then turn all this uh, uh, crisis into opportunities. Yes, lots of vulnerabilities, we are vulnerable in, many sites, but this can be seen as opportunities for investment. And once we do the right things, I'm sure other people will come. I love uh, uh, the you said thing, that uh, the partnership with Africa is a journey to self-reliance. That exactly is what we want. And that's what we're working towards. Thank you. There we go. On that note, uh, all I can just thank you all for what I think was a great and very insightful panel. Thanks everybody. And let me hand over to uh, Flora from here. Thank you, Ashok.
Yes. Uh, Ache, let me let me just thank you for your excellent moderation of this outstanding panel. To all of the panelists, uh, thank you so much for sharing information about some of these uh, key sectors that are critical for a post-COVID recovery. Um, you all in your optimistic statements, though uh, peppered with uh, a reality about the kinds of things that need to happen, um, but your optimism really uh, confirms for me and for Corporate Council on Africa uh, that uh, the continent is, 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 is ready um, for partnership and is uh, resilient. And if we all come together in the kind of uh, public-private partnerships that uh, Kareem mentioned and um, Dr. Alade and others, um, that uh, we will get past COVID-19 and then we'll actually go to perhaps uh, newer and better places in uh, the kind of um, uh, post-COVID uh, economic partnerships that we can have. Let me now turn to um, a colleague and friend, Reva Levinson of uh, KRL. She's the president and CEO of uh, KRL International uh, to um, uh, provide us some closing remarks. Reva. Over to you. Okay, thank you, Flori and Carla and uh, Akego for uh, your leadership. Hello, everyone. Um, again, my name is Reva Levinson. I'm the CEO of KRL International. I um, am also an author and a columnist. And for those who promise to virtually connect today, I want to thank you for all the amazing feedback that you've provided to me. It's made me a better writer. I want to thank our distinguished panel, uh, Mohammed, Kareem, Dr. Alade, and Aida for giving us so much to think about. And our moderator, Acha, who I wish could turn his video on, but I don't think he can, for opening the session with one of my favorite words, to reimagine, meaning to imagine again anew, to form a new concept, to recreate, because that's what this week's CCA Leadership Forum has been all about, reimagining the world that we find ourselves in. The COVID-19 pandemic has underscored the truth that a novel virus infection anywhere is a contagion everywhere. And so too, the murder of George Floyd, an unarmed black man whose last breath was seized by the knee of a white police officer has shown another universal certainty that in our globalized age, an injustice anywhere is an injustice everywhere. What are our responsibilities to our organizations, public and private, to our communities, to our African partners? And across the ocean, what are the responsibilities of African governments to their citizens and to their next generation? Big questions, I know, and I wanna thank the CCA for providing this forum to discuss it. But for now, with the remainder of my time, I wanna to turn to Acha's nine points of reimagination of Africa. And with his permission, I'm going to add two and ask consideration if McKinsey might add them to the list. My number 10, so remember there were nine folks, Acha had nine, so my number 10, would be to remove ourselves from the silos that we all tend to operate in. The government silo, NGO silo, local business, foreign business, the donors, multilateral, civil society, media, we're often pitted against one another and we miss out on the opportunities to collaborate. Fortunately, in the time of this health emergency, many such barriers have been broken, but they need to stay so. These barriers need to remain in a continuous state of disrepair. Let me give you an example in Ghana, where the private sector, local and foreign, stood up the West Africa private sector coronavirus platform to support the government's COVID-19 response, filling in the gaps in critical areas like the scaling up of testing, coordination on regulatory policy to spur recovery, and acting as an echo chamber for public education. This multi-sector, multi-affiliation effort is the first time 
that domestic and foreign businesses, including representatives of the informal economy, have come together to help design interventions. It's a big deal and it needs to stay on. My second to Acha's list, and excuse me, I'm gonna take a sip of water, is that we do all we can as a collective to vest young Africans in their democratic institutions, to believe that they can make a difference through their participation in the political process and that the national, local and regional governments represent their interests. Afrobarometer re recently completed a survey of attitudes across the continent about impact to COVID-19. And they found that there was strong institutional support for democracy and accountable governance. And that when there's trust in leadership, a country was more likely to see a community-based mobilization to respond to the pandemic. And we all know community-based mobilization is the key. Their data also showed the ineffectiveness of heavy-handed security forces and the concern that COVID-19 not be an excuse to take away long sought democratic freedoms. And for me, I'd like to shout out today to Malawi, if folks are following the news, which on Monday conducted its rerun of its national and presidential elections demanded earlier this year by an unprecedented Supreme Court decision. It was peaceful participatory, and it appears that a unified opposition has since won by more than 50 plus 1%. So Acha, over to you. I hope McKinsey will consider these ideas. They're not data fed, but um, they come across from the comments on the many columns that I write. And in closing, I wanna thank all of my panelists and the CCA for this opportunity I wanna urge everyone to watch tomorrow's closing session, both President Nana Kufuwato and President Kenyatta will join. And I also wanna challenge this virtual audience to create their own points of reimagination and share them with the team at CCA so we can continue this conversation. Thanks very much, it's a pleasure. <laughs>